In our last episode, we infiltrated Vault Zero, and while working our way through the facility, we learned more about what went on there. When the super mutants attacked Vault Zero a year or so ago, the scientists and vault dwellers who were stored there in cryogenic sleep were released. The scientists emerged to discover that most of the Vault Zero dwellers had suffered brain damage, reverting these artists and geniuses from pre-war America into blubbering infantile idiots. We found the vault dweller residents alive, walking around mumbling to themselves, but we didn't find any scientists still alive. The only scientist corpse we found in Vault Zero had apparently been recently butchered by one of the calculator's robots. There, like at Scott City, we found evidence that the calculator was butchering humans. We found the corpse of a raider and a ghoul on an operating table. Was the calculator lobotomizing them like they did to General Barnaby? After destroying all robots, saving the members of Dagger Squad, and restoring power to the elevator, we took it down to reach the calculator's lair. We arrive in a small square room with only one door against the eastern wall. As soon as we open it... That's far enough, warrior. Can you recognize me now? Even in my new form? You've come a long way since my departure, but you haven't come far enough. The Brotherhood has caused many setbacks for us recently. But that's all they are. Just setbacks. You cannot stop the future. Just as you can't stop falling rain from reaching the ground. The Calculator offers humanity a world of order and peace. A world free of war, of mutants and chaos. The Brotherhood would be wise to realize that their cause has been tainted by misdirection and genetic mutation. But they can still save themselves if they stop trying to prevent the unavoidable. However, you are too close to my new master and salvation to be allowed to continue. I salute you, warrior. But this is where your mission ends. It's General Barnaby. He's still alive, kind of. The calculator lobotomized him at Scott City and put his brain in a robot. And at last, the prophecy we received from Daw the Shaman at Peoria all the way back in Episode 5 begins to make sense. The future of this land will be tempered in sacrifice. It might be Brotherhood. It might be your yet unseen enemy. It might be the child of the union between the two. That is all I can tell you. I am Da, spirit seeker of what you do. I have spoken. The calculator was our unseen enemy, and General Barnaby is the child of the union between the two, between the Brotherhood and the calculator. How could Dahl have seen this? Perhaps he is a psyker. Perhaps he really can see the future. But now Barnaby is corrupted. We've got to put him down. Oh my god. The sound of your lifeless body hitting the ground echoes the collapse of the Brotherhood. The war is over. If only you had another chance. Okay. Well, opening the door and taking two steps in, the entire party is dead. Let's give this some thought. So Barnaby is at the end of the room, and the perimeter of the room is lined by robots with missile launchers. How are we gonna get through this? Well, instead of standing directly in front of the door, we can set our squad to the sides of the door, then open it and quickly run back. I sat here trying to think about what to do for a minute, but then General Barnaby bursts through the door. What are my scanners detecting? A mere trinket? My holidays, too. My wife, Maria. What? What have I done? I've almost forgotten you, my love. I, I will not hinder you anymore, warrior. At least until I'm able to sort out this conflict between my new programming and these revived feelings. I need time to think. To remember, my Maria. Barnaby sees either 
the holotape that Gamoran took from him that we found at Osceola, or the locket that his wife gave him and that the calculator left on his body at Scott City. He'll recognize either artifact differently, but only slightly. My, my locket, Maria. But if we have both of them in our inventory, the hollow disk takes precedence, and he'll only acknowledge it. If we left these in the Hummer or back at any of the bunkers, we miss this opportunity. But if they're on our inventory, here General Barnaby stops. However, not always. I found General Barnaby's behavior to be inconsistent during the numerous times I tried this battle. Even after telling us he would no longer stand in our way, he continued to attack. And he tore through my party. Well, if there was ever a time to use the Gauss miniguns, it's now. Making sure both Alice and Cookie have them equipped, we can tear down Barnaby. However, this behavior of his is inconsistent with the way this encounter is supposed to go. And it's inconsistent with what he told us. He said he was going to leave us alone. And I think this issue crops up if we're using burst weapons. Barnaby doesn't discover the holotape and locket on our inventory at the beginning of the battle. It's only after we do enough damage to him that he pauses and speaks. Incidentally, if we don't have either the holotape or the locket, he still pauses at this point, but instead of backing down, he says this. Your efforts are for naught. I am too powerful in my new form. The calculator was logical to enlist me into its service. My knowledge of the Brotherhood's internal and external workings ensured us time and space to complete many of our objectives. While you have disrupted a fair amount of these plans, rest assured, you are here now only because the calculator arranged it so. Now, let's finish this. The problem arises when using burst weapons, because if our burst damage continues to harm him after he has spoken, I think he continues to attack. I found that one way to get around this is to switch to turn-based mode. After the battle begins, if we hide our men behind the elevator, we can wait for Barnaby to approach. Then when he gets close, we can jump out and hit him once. What are my scanners detecting? A mere trinket? That initiates his dialogue. And then since we're playing in turn-based, we can make sure that all of our attacks from here on out are only on the other robots. This is time-consuming and tedious. These robots have rocket launchers and extreme range. We need to make great use of our snipers to pick off each of these robots with precision shots so as not to damage Barnaby. In this way, I was eventually able to destroy all of the robots, and the battle would end. And afterwards, we find Barnaby standing here. At the moment, we can't talk with him. We can't interact with him. He doesn't move. He doesn't do anything. But that's also not how this is supposed to work. After abandoning the battle, he's supposed to walk off. And I only got that to happen once. One time I tried this encounter, I attacked him, he initiated dialogue, and then he correctly stopped attacking us, turned around, and walked away. Then, after he cleared the room, I was able to just run in with my squad and finish off the robots. With that, we defeat General Barnaby, either by killing him, in which case he drops a thousand rounds of 50 caliber ammunition, or by causing him to contemplate his existence. He walked off, but we have no idea where he went. After looting the wreckages and healing on up, we find one path forward. We can open a door to the south, but doing so, we find ourselves surrounded by laser turrets. But we manage to get through. Heading across this bridge, we arrive at a pathway that goes east and west. Taking it east leads to a dead end, so instead we follow it west. This turns a corner to the south. We find what must be the end of a bridge that was never built over this chasm, next to a light blinking red to the west. It doesn't go anywhere. To the east, we see a door. That's probably where we need to go. But the path also continues to the south. 
I followed it all the way south, whereupon it winds east. But following it all the way to the east leads to yet another dead end. So it looks like our path forward is through this door. Heading through. Intruder alert. Intruder alert. Countermeasures activated. Defense systems engaged. It's the calculator. The calculator shields itself with big metal barriers that rise and surround it. It appears to be powered by a series of pipes that are connected to brains in jars. Each of these brains is different and says different things. The first is the game designer brain. I told them we have to optimize the graphics for PIP90. Guys, I have a great game idea about a post-nuclear RPG. Now is the time to put out some games. The market is wide open. Next is the evangelist brain. God wants you to get to heaven, but believe me when I tell you, it ain't cheap. How dare you? I bring the word of God to trailer parks everywhere. I did not touch that prostitute. Jesus will set you free if you send a pledge to the number on my container. Next is the porn star brain. I told them that an actor of my caliber wouldn't share a dressing room nor a cryogenic container. Next, I will reenact a scene from Cats the Mounting. I was up for the lead role in Shaved and Dangerous and Backdoor Shenanigans 5. The next one is the Lawyer Brain. I can solve this dilemma for all involved parties. My services are reasonably priced. We can take this conflict to arbitration. The calculator has a good case. I think you should settle. And the last one is the doctor brain. I can't speak with you unless you have medical insurance. Without having a tongue, I can't tell the difference between an oral and rectal thermometer. Oh. Lean your pelvis on my container, then turn and cough. So these are some of the brains that powered the calculator. Remember, we learned from previous lore that their initial experiment was to power the calculator using rodent brains. But then, after getting the best and brightest into Vault Zero, they were going to power it with human brains. But these were the best and brightest? A game designer, an evangelist, a porn star, a lawyer, and a doctor? It's quite an eclectic collection. We can't talk with any of these brains aside from listening to their floating dialogue. Exploring the room, we find a number of locked doors, three in the eastern wall, but we can't access any of them. Looks like to get through, we've got to reduce power to the calculator, and the only way to do that is to destroy some of these brains. Now, even though they're not hostile, we can hold control to target them individually and directly and destroy them. However, if we do this to all of the brains, we lose a ton of karma. I started with the karma level of Guardian of the Wastes, and after destroying each brain by targeting them directly, my karma level had degraded to simply Warrior. Guardian of the Wastes is the second best good karma level. Warrior is neutral. I went all the way from the top of good karma down to neutral by doing this. But we have to destroy these brains to continue. However, there is a way to destroy them without losing karma. We can do so by planting explosives or by using burst mode on our weapons and targeting the ground around them. It doesn't make a lick of sense, but we walk away without losing any karma. And this is extremely important, because this is a quick way to completely destroy the karma that we have been carefully building the entire gameplay. And karma does affect the ending that we get. Interestingly, another time I went through this encounter, I actually got some pop-up dialogue while trying to destroy the brains, but only from one of them. The evangelist brain says, no! I'm not ready to face judgment. (laughs) I am so in league with the devil. But that was the only one I got to pop up. At any rate, it's clear where we need to go next. Moving east, we can head through the northernmost of the three doors. 
Opening it. we clear the room. At the end of the room is a terminal, and accessing it, we remove an electric barrier protecting the artist brain. Beauty is in the optical sensor of the beholder. The wasteland is too drab. Some lush greens and deep blues would liven things up nicely. I was painting masterpieces before Rembrandt soiled his first diaper. Really? I mean, Rembrandt was born in 1606. Was this artist born in the 16th century? Well, how did they get their hands on a brain that had been dead? How is that possible? Well, looks like to open the next door, we've got to continue to reduce the calculator's power. And this time, by destroying the artist brain. Damn it, says the brain. I thought it hurt when I cut off my ear. Well, wait a minute. Now is this supposed to be the brain of Vincent van Gogh? Because he was born in 1853, that definitely makes him younger than Rembrandt. Okay, whatever, let's just kill this thing. With that, the next door opens. Heading out, we can move back to the calculator's room and move to door number two. Stepping inside... robot's dead, we can access the terminal to remove the second electric barrier. This room was guarding the scientist brain. I prefer enriched plutonium as fuel due to a more constant power distribution. I scrammed my first reactor prototype when I was 15. Coolant purity is essential within the reactor's primary system. When ready, we can try to destroy this one. Stop, it says. Such actions have severely weakened the covalent bonds of my gray matter. That we can ignore him. With that, the third door opens. Heading back to the calculator's room and moving down the hallway, we see that it turns south. Making sure our squad is completely healed up, we can open the door into the southern room. And just like the last two, we can access the terminal to remove the electric barrier. This was guarding the politician brain. I give you my word that I did not have sexual relations with that actor brain. Oh, wait, wait a minute. So that's a reference to Bill Clinton, but Monica Lewinsky wasn't an actress. Maybe it's JFK's brain? He allegedly had an affair with Marilyn Monroe, but that wouldn't make sense because... Well, I honestly don't remember making any tax cut promises during my election. Besides, I don't have any lips to read. All right, so that's a reference to George H.W. Bush. Read my lips, no new taxes, quote. When ready, we can destroy it. I'm hit, I'm hit, he says. Where in damnation is my secret service brain? And we can finish the job. With that, the shield protecting the calculator slides down. Gathering the squad, we can move back into the calculator's lair. But before we can go down the stairs... Greetings. I am the calculator, overseer of the vault network. You have proven to be a statistical anomaly that crashed my logistics programs time and time again. It is my admiration of your adaptation and ingenuity that brings you to me. 
I assume that you would agree that ten behemoth robots would terminate you and your squad. I have the resources to make such an offensive, but it is not in my interest. After all, you are quite the remarkable human, and more importantly, you have something I need. Oh, that's a bold claim, Calculator. She thinks she could have killed us at any time. No, we're only here because she wants us here. We have something she needs, but what exactly could that be? If we killed General Barnaby, or if we experienced the glitch where he didn't move out of the first battle room, then we arrive in this square with just our squad in the calculator. However, if Barnaby abandoned the battle, we find him standing here next to the calculator. Maria, what am I to do, he says. <gasps> I'm so sorry, but... But the mutations will roam unchecked. This goes against my programming. Either way, we can talk to the calculator again. It is the organic portion of my mainframe that has become corrupted. The degeneration of my symbiotic brains has corrupted 85% of main protocol programming. It would take only one brain to bring my organic subsystems back online, but finding a feasible brain has become a problem. I would use a brain from one of Vault Zero's residents, but I compute that my CPU would only become less efficient. And suddenly things are beginning to make a bit of sense. We learned from previous holotapes that the glitch that kept the calculator from waking up on time also damaged the cryogenic sleep pods, killing many of the Vault Zero residents and causing severe brain damage to the ones that survived. We saw this on full display in Vault Zero when we explored cryogenics. And now we know why the calculator released the Vault Zero citizens from their stasis pods. She wanted a new brain, but she couldn't find any viable brains in any of the residents. Perhaps this can explain why we don't find any Vault Zero scientists alive. Maybe the calculator resorted to going after their brains as well. Though if that's the case, I wonder why she ended up not using them. Or maybe she did, but she just didn't get enough of them. And it explains why we found the raider and the ghoul butchered inside Vault Zero. And the internment camp. And butchery at Scott City filled with human corpses. The calculator was looking for suitable replacement brains to augment its processor. Talking to the calculator again. However, there is another solution. Yours is a brain that can bring balance to my organic neural network. I am offering you what humans call a dream come true. You can shed your mortal shell and join with me. You will share my power and resources to save humanity and restore civilization from the smoking ruins of the wasteland. Your name will never be forgotten and be synonymous with the word hero. Oh, well, isn't that a nicely packaged bit of irony? The calculator was programmed to rid the world of mutations, a task it was currently undertaking when it was stopped by the Brotherhood. But what does the calculator need to get back into working order? A post-war tribal brain. That's right, our brain. We're a tribal recruit from Chicago into the Brotherhood. We grew up and were raised around all of this post-apocalyptic radiation. Our DNA and presumably our mind has been corrupted, but it is a suitable candidate. Maybe all of this radiation and all of these mutations are not quite so bad. But the calculator, of course, can't piece that together. It's simply going based off of its programming. Talking to her a final time. What say you, warrior? Will you continue to fight me? Destroy me and continue to carve some small, insignificant niche for the Brotherhood? While the Brotherhood may tame a region, they will never have the lasting impact I alone can. The machinery you see before you has the capacity to remove your brain from its mortal vessel. It is in this machine that your journey to save mankind will truly begin. You must hurry, human. My systems cannot function long without a symbiotic brain. Oh man, it's like right out of the playbook of the scientists at Big Mountain. They're gonna take our brain out of our body. But with that, a 60 second countdown timer begins. We've got to make a decision here. What are we going to do? Well, there are five possible choices that we can make. We could simply say hogwash to the whole idea and destroy the calculator.
Or we can just let the timer run out. Alert. Alert. Communications grid offline. External operatives in dormant mode. Calculated neural net collapse in three, two, one. End program. Or we can do as the calculator suggests and sacrifice ourself. To do so, we walk to the machine bathed in red light to the north. Here we can access the terminal, and when we do... Or, if we don't want to commit suicide, we can instruct any of our squad mates to do so instead. And they'll all obey us. <coughs> but there is a fifth and final way we can end this. And to do so, we need to cast our mind back again to the words of Dahl the Shaman. He said something else to us all the way back in Peoria. What was it again? I sense that the future of this land can ride on your decisions, or you may let another decide. He is your brother, but he will be reborn. That's all the dead will tell me. I am Dal, spirit seeker of Wachutu. I have spoken. The future of this land rides on our decisions or we can let another decide, and this other person is our brother who has been reborn? Well, now we understand the prophecy. It's General Barnaki, our brother, who has been reborn. And here he stands, contemplating his Maria. I have another answer, he says. I would sacrifice myself for Maria in the Wastelands. Talking with him. I might have another answer, brother. Fate has seen fit to use my Maria to show me that my life is not whole anymore. Through my quest to pull humanity from the darkness, I in turn have become inhuman. My Maria would be horrified at what I have become, and that is one burden I cannot bear to carry. I would sacrifice my own brain, my own existence, to make the calculator whole and to help form a world that would make my Maria proud. I leave the decision to you, brother. Talk to me again if you wish me to become one with the calculator. Barnaki offers to sacrifice himself, to offer up his brain and merge it with the calculator. But is this a wise decision? What kind of world will it become, run by a calculator merged with Simon Barnaki? He says that he wants to make a world that would make his Maria proud. But what kind of world would make her proud? We've gotten to know Simon Barnaki a little bit over the course of this game, and while he seems to be honest and hardworking and fearless in the face of danger, he is also kind of, uh, you know, a racist against mutants and ghouls and, well, creatures that aren't exactly human. If we want Simon Barnaki to sacrifice himself, we talk with him again. Thank you for granting me this, brother. Just tell her. Tell her that I love her with all of my heart. Oh, wait. That's gone. Tell her I love her with all of my immortal soul. And please, tell her I did not forget my promise. He didn't forget his promise. Well, what promise was that? Well, sadly, the promise he's referring to here was cut from the game. However, we found the transcript of his letter to his wife Maria in the files of the game, and we listened to that transcript during the Osceola mission. His promise to his wife went as follows. My dearest Maria, although it pains me to record this, I must continue. Time is short and my future is less than certain. I'm currently captured and held prisoner by a large group of super mutants, and I don't believe that I'm going to make it back this time. But once again, time is short, and I'll use it to tell you what is important. I love you, Maria. I've loved you since we first met, and I love you even more 50 years since. 
We were always much alike, you and I. And know that I would never have had the courage to fight for humanity without you faithfully by my side. For in the end, I realize I did it all for you. For I wanted nothing more but to restore order to this chaotic world so you can live a life free of danger, free of fear, free of ungodly mutations. I'm afraid I'm out of time. I'll make every attempt to fix this world for you, my love. I promise. Love eternal. Simon Barnicky. His promise to his wife is to fix the world, to restore order, to make the world free of ungodly mutations. Oh God, that sounds an awful lot like what the calculator was programmed to do. And we just had him walk into the brain harvesting machine. Allow me this final honor for Maria, he says. Now, incidentally, if you experience the glitch I did while fighting him in turn-based mode, he never actually makes it here to the calculator. He stays in that first boss room fight, and he only starts moving after we talk with him. We have to go back during the 60-second countdown to talk with him, have him agree to sacrifice his brain, and then walk all the way back to the brain harvesting machine but 60 seconds isn't enough time for him to do so. So if you experience this glitch in your gameplay, and if you want to harvest Barnaki's brain, you'll have to start this part of the mission over and hope that after the Barnaki battle, he walks to the calculator. At any rate, he dutifully sacrifices himself. Any option we choose that ends with a brain being harvested has the calculator say this. Neural net stabilizing. Organic processor installation complete. Transmitting halt orders to all external units. I, we, our merge begins. If we destroy the calculator, or we allow the time to run out, we get the following ending. When the acrid smoke clears, nothing remains of the entity known as the calculator, except burnt wires and broken valves. It is a decisive victory for humanity, for at the crucial point in the raging battle, the robots were stopped dead in their course of destruction. The warrior can only ponder on the lost opportunity that the destruction of such a technological marvel represents. History has shown that even the victors of battle have some regrets, but sometimes one must move forward. The Brotherhood is quick to establish Vault Zero as its main base of operations. Although much destruction was wrought here, 
it still represents a massive storehouse of knowledge and technology. The ancient structure becomes the central hub of operations, coordinating between outposts far and near, and reinforcing their supply lines and transport routes across the countryside, ironically mimicking the original purpose of their defeated enemy. Recruitment and education of the local tribal and village populations becomes the all-important mission of the depleted and wounded brotherhood. But the education is not one-sided. After generations of surviving in the harshness of the wastelands, the indigenous people are in tune with the land. They have valuable lessons to teach those immersed solely in technology, lessons of nature and balance that the Brotherhood had previously neglected. Not all of the Wasteland's inhabitants are sharing the same noble purpose. Opportunistic raiders and bandits enjoy the fruits of a recovering war-torn Brotherhood. Patrols are scarce and in smaller numbers than the thieves remember encountering in the past as the Brotherhood focuses on consolidating its power base. Several frontier outposts are lost as the Brotherhood finds they are fighting a guerrilla war without the support of large numbers. But adversity and hardship are as familiar to the Brotherhood as discipline and knowledge, and they learn their lessons quickly. With a new power over this region comes a new responsibility. All plans for re-establishing contact with the West are postponed indefinitely. Recruitment begins anew, and the initiate ranks swell. All military efforts are then concentrated on uprooting all outlaw predators in the region, finally making it safe for the Brotherhood and its allies. In time, the Brotherhood once again rules the land. Resources are then allocated to expansion and development. Technology becomes more widespread, with irrigation systems established to make the nuclear-blasted land fertile. Humanity once again starts to prosper. The hero, the warrior of the Brotherhood, now a general, shares the burden and the satisfaction of overseeing civilization's development. The Brotherhood of Steel has come through the trials of this region and emerged scarred but wiser. It will be decades before a reunion is possible between the old Brotherhood and the new Brotherhood regime. In that time, there are new alliances to be made, new battles to be fought, new victories to be had. But that is a tale for another day. If, however, we chose to sacrifice ourselves or to sacrifice any member of our party, we get the following ending. And this ending changes slightly based on our character's karma. If we have bad or neutral karma, we get the following ending. Having weighed the options, the warrior purposefully strides into the calculator's brain-removing mechanism. While this union of mind and machine represents an end to the hero's mortal shell, it also promises rebirth with the power and resources essential to rescue civilization from the brink of oblivion. With the mind of the warrior working in conjunction with the ancient machine's sheer processing power, a new and potent calculator thunders into existence. Years of neglected faults and decay are repaired almost instantly becoming the catalyst for dozens of defunct systems to flash back into full operation. The calculator becomes whole for the first time since its conception. Contact is immediately established with the Brotherhood Elders and an alliance is formed, but while no longer an opponent, the calculator chooses to not directly serve the Brotherhood. A delegation of the top Brotherhood Elders departs for Vault Zero to discuss details of the new alliance they never reach their destination. Brotherhood soldiers and robots alike are dispatched to investigate. However, no traces of the ill-fated expedition were found. The impact on Brotherhood morale was devastating. For every soldier knows, leaders define rules, and rules shape the Brotherhood. 
The calculator quickly integrates with the surviving Brotherhood leaders. Protocol robots infused with knowledge of Brotherhood procedure begin to handle operations in Brotherhood outposts. Behemoth robots are sent to bunkers and allied towns to ease the strain of basic needs like patrols while maintaining a military show of force to keep outlaws at bay. Soon, the Alliance is discarded with all forces now under one computerized leader. The Brotherhood is, once again, reborn. To speed the unification process, discrimination against mutates is outlawed. The new Brotherhood views these creatures as a valuable resource instead of a threat to be eliminated. Old hatreds and fears are soon set aside as humans, ghouls, super mutants, and death claws work together to carry out the Brotherhood's plans for transforming the wastelands into a post-nuclear utopia. The new regime begins to expand across the wasteland, absorbing towns and villages, and quickly dispatching those that would halt progress. Soon, the Brotherhood is protector to a string of settlements with entire regions under its influence. As the calculator's power grows, so does its hold on the continent. But one question remains. What will happen when this new force encounters the original knowledge-hoarding Brotherhood of Steel? In the depths of Vault Zero, the calculator processes millions of possible scenarios in preparation for the inevitable meeting. It will not be as easy to eliminate the original West Coast Brotherhood elders but it must be done, for in the end, there can only be one leader. One that is willing to sacrifice anything or anyone to unify the wasteland. So the bad karma ending appears to regard the warrior's brain and any member of his or her squad as the same. And in this ending, the ultimate goal is to wage war against the West Coast chapter of the Brotherhood. And in this ending, the Brotherhood elders of this Midwestern chapter disappear in a convoy on its way to the Calculator's lair. I don't think they can simply disappear. Could it be that the warrior, as the calculator, got rid of them? This ending clearly gives us the impression that the warrior-calculator merger has created a new omnipotent dictator for the Midwest of America. But if we sacrifice ourselves or one of our party members with good karma, we learn the following. Deep in the warrior's heart, the decision had been made long ago to forfeit one's life for the security of others. What nobler end could there be? Sacrifices were always expected, but to lose one's mortal shell and join with a machine is not an ending. Instead, it is a new beginning, revolving around the rebirth of humanity. The first command to speed through the new calculator's relays is the disabling of the active robotic forces, averting the sterilization of all life on the continent. The warrior's mind had proven itself exceptional time and again in the field of battle. Now, working in conjunction with the calculator's sheer processing power, a union between the Brotherhood of Steel and the robotic forces quickly takes shape. The region sees new laws established to ease humanity back into civilized life. Laws that are strictly enforced by the combined patrols of Brotherhood soldiers and pacification robots. To speed the unification process, discrimination against mutates is outlawed. Many prejudices are eliminated through education or the harsh implementation of Brotherhood justice. The willingness to overcome differences opens avenues of recruitment that would have otherwise remained unutilized. Mutated creatures that wish to live in peace under the new regime are welcomed, though hesitantly, into the population. Old hatreds and fears are soon forgotten as the task at hand becomes apparent. Humans, ghouls, super mutants, and death claws all work together to begin transforming the wastelands into a post-nuclear utopia. The combined knowledge of the Brotherhood and Calculator's databases are a powerful tool for reshaping the world, and no time is wasted. Technology is slowly reintroduced into the land. Irrigation systems are established bringing water to the barren soils for the first time in decades. 
New settlements spring up as land becomes fertile once again, with places of learning becoming the hubs of the fledgling civilization. A combination of old world science with new world wisdom paves the way to higher understanding and unity among the population. The new regime begins to expand across the wasteland, absorbing towns and villages, and quickly dispatching those that would halt progress. Soon, the Brotherhood is protector to a string of settlements. As the Brotherhood's power grows, so does its hold on the wasteland. But one question remains. What will happen when this young civilization encounters the original, knowledge-hoarding Brotherhood of Steel? The scribes and elders prepare for the meeting and hope to put differences in the past as the future of mankind hangs in the balance. But that is a battle for another day and perhaps another hero. So with the good karma ending, the being created by the merger between the warrior and the calculator does not set himself up as a dictator. He doesn't remove the elders of the Midwestern chapter that are a threat to his power. He doesn't prepare for a war against the West Coast elders of the Brotherhood, and instead focuses on unity, irrigation, education, rebuilding civilization. Interesting that both the good karma and bad karma options outlaw bigotry against mutates in the Midwest. But if we allow Simon Barnaby to sacrifice himself and use his brain to fulfill the promise he gave to his beloved Maria, we get the following ending. The general, driven by the memory of his wife and convinced by your words, boldly steps into the chamber. His brain is removed once again and placed into a specially constructed container. Now the sole organic influence on the calculator's supercomputer neural network, he finds himself united with an enemy he had sworn to destroy. His only objective is to restore order to the chaotic wastes and provide his beloved wife with the security he had promised so long ago. The new calculator dedicates its existence to the rescuing of pure-blood humanity from the brink of destruction. Order is established, with the Brotherhood soldiers and calculator robots enforcing new laws and spearheading the task of rebuilding and re-educating mankind. The first step is to comfort the battle-weary region. Combined groups of Brotherhood soldiers and robots are dispatched to patrol troubled areas. These forces are charged with the task of dealing the bandit lords a blow that will take them years to recover from. Technology is slowly reintroduced into the land. Irrigation systems are established, bringing water to the barren soils for the first time in decades. New settlements spring up as trade routes become safe from attacks. Once again, humanity begins to prosper. For the various mutates of the land their destiny is somewhat darker. All known genetic divergence are immediately rounded up into internment camps and registered. Those that comply are forced to endure harsh conditions in labor gulags, where their unique abilities are exploited in tasks considered too dangerous or simply beneath pure-blood humans. Humans who speak out against this new system are disciplined or silenced. Those mutants who choose to flee are ruthlessly hunted like animals. These unfortunates are captured, killed, and displayed across the region as a gruesome reminder to all impure life forms that disobedience from lesser creatures will be met with uncompromising punishment. Small factions of humans, defiant of the new Brotherhood dictatorship, join their outcast cousins to form the Mutant Liberation Army. Any creature suspected of supporting this outlawed faction are quickly rounded up and interrogated by the General's hand-picked inquisitors. Many are never seen again. But for every disappearance, for every public execution by the new regime, another rebel joins the outlaw movement. Soon, the Brotherhood finds itself under repeated attack. The Mutant Liberation Army attempts to utilize guerrilla tactics to offset the overwhelming combined force of robot and Brotherhood soldiers. The rebels fight for many reasons now. Revenge, freedom, and a chance for a better life. Some join the battle because waging war is all they know. 
It is a struggle they are destined to lose. For humanity, however, progress is made. It comes slowly at first, for time is an ingredient as important as order and determination when great changes are to be made. Soon, without the required resources and firepower, the Mutant Liberation Army is driven west, back to an area where many of them met bitter defeat not long ago. Their actions becoming more and more desperate when they realize they are being driven back into a region controlled by the Old Brotherhood. Humanity rules the land again, while the mutates have nothing but death. It lies waiting over every hill, behind every rock, through every crosshair. They are without justice. They are without hope. Such is life in the wasteland. And that is the end to Fallout Tactics. After the ending movie, we are dumped back into the menu. We can't continue to explore the wasteland. There are mods we can install that allow us to play after we complete the game. But for the purposes of this series, I'm going to reload a save that I made before we entered Cheyenne Mountain to continue to explore the wasteland and discover every unique special encounter in the Midwest of the United States of America. If you don't want to miss that video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. So which ending do you think is canonical? Knowing everything we now know about what happened after the events of Fallout Tactics? The story of Fallout 2. Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, and 4. Which of these endings do you think best accommodate the plots of those games? Which do you think is more likely? A brotherhood embattled in the Midwest against raiders and cutthroats without the power of the calculator and his technology? A brotherhood with a calculator at the helm who acts as a despot, lording over the Midwest and planning war against the West Coast? A brotherhood that is trying to rebuild society and hopes for peaceful negotiations with the West Coast elders at a future date. Or a brotherhood that commits genocide against non-humans. A brotherhood that pushes everyone who isn't considered a pure blood West. And most importantly, which option did you choose for your game? Let me know in the comments below. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon gain access to a members-only channel on my Discord server, and YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos, and they gain access to ox emojis that they can use in the comments and during the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I just want to say thank you so much for sticking with me through this entire long but really interesting series. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed putting it together. But don't go anywhere, because even though Fallout Tactics is ending, something new is about to begin. I'll see you soon with more lore videos and more live streams.